Just the Facts is a periodic publication of the MWRA Advisory Board. This installment explores specific bacteria and wastewater effluent from Deer Island Treatment Plant, which is among the largest wastewater facilities in the nation. The focus here is on Enterococcus, an indicator bacteria. We'll be taking a look at how this could affect the bay. Let's start at the beginning. Deer Island's NIPTES permit allows the discharge of treated wastewater into the bay. MassDEP determines the terms of this permit. The effluent travels 9.5 miles through an underwater tunnel before being released through diffusers. The vast majority of other wastewater treatment plants typically discharge into closely located surface waters. For comparison, the Salem, Lynn, and Cohasset wastewater treatment plants empty their effluent into nearby coves, clearly much closer than Deer Island's outfall. At Deer Island, the authority rigorously tests this effluent to make sure limits are not exceeded. They are obligated to test for fecal coliform, which is a bacterium found in human waste. High levels would mean the water isn't clean enough to be discharged into the bay and can pose a risk to human health if ingested. In addition to mandatory testing for fecal coliform, MWRA also tests for another indicator bacteria called Enterococcus, which is not yet in the NIPIS permit. So why is the authority sampling for Enterococcus in wastewater effluent when it's not even necessary? More and more, in Europe and across the U.S., regulatory agencies are using Enterococcus rather than fecal coliform as the standard indicator bacteria. So by taking Enterococcus samples, the authority is preparing for any changes to the permit in the future. They take these samples three times a day, 365 days a year at the plant. What have they found while sampling? The short answer is not much. The authority compared samples in the effluent to the 2000 limit set for shellfishing and swimming in Massachusetts. They found that between 2008 and 2016, there was only one month where the monthly average exceeded the Enterococcus limit. This exception occurred in March 2010, meaning no other monthly average between 2010 and 2016 exceeded this limit. The authority's data shows a very distinct seasonal trend. Note that the temperature scale is reversed. Enterococcus levels are shown by the red line. They are highest in the winter months and they decrease to their lowest in the summer months. The lower bacteria levels in the summer are likely due to the fact that the chlorine-based process to remove bacteria is most effective in warmer temperatures. This means that during the summer and fall, when the effluent is at its highest temperature, more bacteria will be removed. The other factor is contact time, which is shown by the pink line. Its scale is also reversed. Longer contact time during disinfection means more bacteria killed. Since wastewater flow is lowest in the summer, there is longer contact time. Combined with the warmer temperatures, this leads to lower bacteria levels in the summer. So what about that one monthly average when the limit was exceeded? It turns out that March 2010 was marked by record-breaking storms. Some MWRA communities received up to 18 inches of precipitation. The excessive flows meant much shorter contact time, plus cooler temperatures in March, which led to the highest enterococcus levels recorded between 2008 and 2016. We are clearly seeing seasonal trends in the effluent, but what about in the bay water itself? The authority has sampled enterococcus in the bay where the effluent is released nine and a half miles out from the shore. The samples have either been non-detects or very low compared to the effluent numbers. There have been no seasonal trends in the bay. Therefore, one could safely conclude that the enterococcus in the effluent has no significant effect on the enterococcus in the bay. So the big question is, what would a change really cost? And does it make sense to spend more money on more chemicals? While additional chemicals can lead to 100% enterococcus sterilization, there would be additional, more damaging side effects as a result. Let's take a look at some of these side effects. First, two types of chemicals are used in this process, sodium hypochlorite to kill the enterococcus 
and sodium bisulfite to remove extra chlorine from the first step. Even after dechlorination, this higher dose of chemicals can still create toxic effluent that can put marine life at risk. Second, more chemicals to treat enterococcus means more chemical deliveries through the town of Winthrop. Currently, Deer Island receives about 280 trucks per year for sodium hypochlorite and sodium bisulfite. If enterococcus is added to the NIPTES permit for all of fiscal year 18, this will mean 200 more trucks or a 71% increase. One might wonder whether barging would be an option given all this proposed additional trucking traffic. Unfortunately, there are no current vendors who offer bulk chemical delivery via barge. If any vendors did emerge, Deer, Deer Island would have to replace their existing pipelines to deliver the chemicals from the pier to the facility. This would cost between three and five million dollars, in addition to any barging charges from the suppliers. Finally, the costs to provide for these chemical increases are not trivial. The authority is budgeting an extra $600,000 for enterococcus treatment for the back half of fiscal year 18, assuming the new NIPTES permit goes into effect in December or January. Going forward, this number represents up to $1.3 million per year, a significant and unnecessary cost to ratepayers over time. Let us remember, the water quality standards exist to protect human and ecological health. Using excess chemicals to treat something that has only been an issue when no people would be exposed undermines the purpose of the standards in the first place. Enforcement of such a situation would be regulations for regulation's sake, coming at the cost of marine life and causing more traffic, emissions, and headaches for the town of Winthrop. The advisory board believes in a common sense approach. Ensuring swimming quality water nine and a half miles out from the shore is not exactly common sense. If Deer Island were like other wastewater treatment plants, the effluent would be released into nearby surface water, such as a stream or off of a shoreline. However, Deer Island is totally unlike other wastewater treatment plants. We would concede that Deer Island should meet enterococcus limits if the outfall were in the immediate vicinity of human contact, but hardly any human will be swimming near the outfall, whether in the depths of March or the peak of July. How can the same standards for public health possibly apply? There are two main facts to keep in mind. One, no humans are around the outfall the vast majority of the time, and two, the outfall in Terracaucus level has no effect on the bay level. Knowing these two things should be enough to exempt Deer Island from the Enterococcus limits in a revised NIPTES permit. Regulations should be productive and contribute to the common good. It's important to step back and ask what limit is appropriate and where. And looking at this case, an Enterococcus limit could not in good conscience be called an appropriate regulation. This is neither a wise use of money or chemicals. And last we checked, there were no floating cabanas near the outfall with swimmers the authority needed to protect. The Enterococcus waiver for Deer Island is the fiscally and environmentally responsible thing to do. This has been a Just the Facts presentation from the Advisory Board. For an overview of MWRA data, check out the July 2016 Water Quality Report. For more information on Enterococcus as an indicator bacteria, please visit the EPA's National Aquatic Resource Survey's website. And as always, contact us with any comments or questions.